Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Burrell. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Opportunity within the Department of Administration, and I am delighted to be here today. I have asked my colleague uh, to be here and to join me, uh, so if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Kyle Adamonis, the Executive Director of Human Resources for the Department of Administration, the State of Iran. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, begin my presentation this afternoon to um, talk about the structure of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Opportunity. Uh, we were actually um, created by executive order in 2014 and then through legislation in 2016. Uh, I have provided here a copy of the statute uh, that uh, speaks to our establishment. Um, we are focused primarily on ensuring non-discrimination throughout uh, the state government workforce. Uh, our areas of concern include employment, procurement, uh, policy and practices that are relative to state programs, services and activities. Uh, I oversee uh, four offices. Um, including the State Equal Opportunity Office, which many of you know has been in place for many, many years. It actually was created in 1974, uh, the year before I started working in government. I actually started in 1975. Um, we also have the Human Resources Outreach and Diversity Office, which was created in 2000. Both of those offices, I should mention, were previously under the Division of Human Resources, which is why I've asked my colleague to join me, as many of our duties overlap in many ways, and we'll share some of that uh, with you uh, through the discussions. I also oversee the MBE, or Minority Business Enterprise Compliance Office, uh, which has been around since the mid-'80s, as well as the Supplier Diversity Office. Uh, that's a fairly newly created office formed um, about a year ago, uh, which complements the work of the Minority Business Enterprise Office. In terms of our achievements since our creation, we've only been around uh, as a new division since 2014, and yet uh, through the support and empowerment and uh, uh, work of a great team committed to the work that we're focusing on, we've managed to um, see some achievements. Uh, so I, I wanted to highlight them, if I could, for, for the commission. Uh, in 2014, when we looked at the uh, percentage of procurement by minority and women-owned businesses uh, through the state's procurement practices, we were at about 4.3%. Uh, we looked at ourselves, we conducted a lean review, we uh, spent time looking at practices, uh, policies, and many um, conversations were had about why we couldn't do more, uh, and we began collaborating with procurement officials and doing other things proactively to try to change that. Uh, focus and by the end of 2017, we had reached 7.7 percent participation. Uh, when we looked at ourselves this uh, this year, uh, looking at Q1 and Q2 of FY18, we're already at 16.4 percent participation. So we're making great strides in that area. And considering the employment. Uh, of diversity within the state government workforce. Um, and we've been looking at our numbers in terms of monthly hiring. So we, we focused on new hires, that are new people coming into the government workforce. And in 2016, on average, we hired roughly 22% workers of color on a monthly basis. We looked at ourselves um, the same way each month, looking at hiring practices and uh, specifically workers of color, and we increased 6% in one year to, to 28%. And so again, we're very excited about the progress that we're making, yet we still have much more work to do. In looking specifically at the State Equal Opportunity Office, uh, that office is focused on uh, administering uh, Rhode Island General Laws Section 28-1.1-1 through 17. Uh, we know that equal opportunity and affirmative action is the policy of all units of state government. Uh, we're required uh, to, that it is required that each state department and agency prepare an affirmative action plan annually. 
Uh, and we also know that appointments, uh, the appointing authority is uh, responsible for annually conducting what's known as a utilization analysis, uh, both on positions uh, within the state government workforce, as well as in looking at appointments to state boards, commissions, public authorities, and other entities within state government. The Equal Opportunity Office um, prohibits, the law prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, national origin, or disability in many areas, including state services and facilities, education training and apprenticeship programs, state employment services, state contracts, law enforcement, healthcare facilities, licensed charter by the state, public education institutions licensed or chartered by the state, state licensing and regulatory agencies, as well as state agencies dispersing financial assistance. Uh, those are the requirements under law uh, of the State Equal Opportunity Office in terms of administering uh, the law and ensuring non-discrimination. Equal Opportunity Law authorizes the State Equal Opportunity Administrate administrator to also institute, initiate, excuse me, initiate complaints of discrimination against any agency, administrator, or employee of any department or division within state government excluding the legislative branch. And it authorizes the Rhode Island Commission for Human Rights to utilize the State Equal Opportunity Office as its liaison with state government. In preparation for our meeting here today, I've put together a, sort of an overview of our complaint process. Uh, and here's where I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Kyle, to give an overview of the human resources process. As um, in our process, um, claims that are brought uh, typically begin uh, with the human resources office. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, our uh, human resources process begins with um, typically what happens is an employee um, has a complaint of sexual harassment um, and they uh, go to either their supervisor or manager within their own department or they come directly to the human resources department. Uh, usually that's a liaison that we have that's out at any one of the agencies um, for the executive branch and they um, give their complaint, um, an overview of their complaint. Um, once that complaint um, is um, heard, then there's an investigation process that happens, and that is done by our human resources liaisons, and then they go through the process hearing the complaint, um, doing an investigation. That investigation um, would include any, um, both the victim and the alleged harasser, as well as any, um, any uh, other persons that would have um, had knowledge of the sexual harassment that happened. So that investigation is, um, completed, we look at the findings, and then um, upon completion, then um, corrective action, any corrective action that needs to be taken will be taken, and the outcome is then uh, communicated to both the uh, victim as well as the um, alleged harasser at that time. In addition to filing a claim with human resources, the uh, employee can also bring their complaint to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Opportunities uh, State Equal Opportunity Office. We will investigate uh, the, any claim that's brought to us uh, in as timely and in as appropriate a manner, a manner as possible. Uh, we, uh, if in fact, um, upon investigation, we determine that there is sufficient evidence or probable cause to believe that a violation has occurred, then um, we can move to try to conciliate the matter. Our goal is to resolve it. Uh, if, in fact, uh, we're unsuccessful, uh, we do have the authority to move uh, for formal hearing. Uh, the Administrative Procedures Act would be uh, the vehicle through which that process would occur. Um, and at the end of that process, if it is found that there has been a violation, we too have the authority to implement um, uh, damages or punitive, make some rep reprimand uh, to address the matter. Um, I would point out that according to our regulations, if a complainant files 
uh, with our office as well as with the Human Rights Commission or directly with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that um, we defer to those commissions to address the matter. In looking at the actual complaints that have been filed, um, we just sort of took a summary of what has um, been reported to us um, and the Division of Human Resources has numbers that they'd like to report. Yes, as of December 2017, eight total sexual harassment complaints were filed in uh, the year 2017. Of those, six cases uh, were closed at that time, two of which resulted in disciplinary action, and two cases um, at that time were open. Um, since that time, those cases have closed. With regard to uh, the tracking of complaints that have come to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Opportunity, um, we have been tracking since 2015. Um, one, one case um, was actually filed in 2016. That case was closed. And in 2017, we had one claim. Um, it, it does seem that most of these claims are handled through the HR process, uh, but to date, this is all we have to report. And that completes my presentation. Cheryl, thank you very much for that. Um, Representative Ella Wilkinson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a couple of questions, ladies, if you don't mind. All right. So um, how often do you conduct prevention of sexual harassment training for the state employees? Yes, so um, we have actually been conducting training for many, many years. Uh, most recently, uh, we have seen an upswing in that training. <clears throat> Uh, I did collect some data to be able to provide to you today. In 2015, we actually trained 171 employees. In 2016, we trained 362 employees. In 2017, we trained 567 employees. And in 2018, by the end of January, we had already trained 523 employees. So I would say that we are absolutely increasing the number of state employees that are going through our training process. And I would say that there's a couple of factors that we can contribute to that. One, we now have a new onboarding process where all new hires are required to go through the orientation training. We also have been working very closely with human resources to encourage exist, existing employees and managers, members of the management team, to attend the training. As a result of that um, focus, we have seen an increase. I would add that um, this year in particular, with the focus that's been on sexual harassment, we've received a number of requests and um, sort of a stronger, more compelling interest in having employees go through the training. Uh, this only reflects those who are members of the state workforce. I would add that I've received requests from municipalities. Uh, I've been training firefighters at, in various cities around the state, um, uh, contractors with the state, um, other municipal employees, um, any request. I've gotten a request, for example, from uh, building Futures, which actually prepares uh, young people for apprenticeship uh, opportunities in the trades. Uh, so we've really spent a lot of time because one of the initiatives that we're focusing on is increasing the number of women in the trades. And so as a result of that, we want to make sure that we're educating uh, those individuals with regard to the importance of um, you know, not violating such acts as, you know, acts of discrimination. Ms. Burrell, does your training include that the employee has the ability to file in dual uh, agencies? Yes, absolutely. So not only do we uh, provide them with information with regard to the chain of command and following that process and reporting claims, but we advise them that they have several, several avenues to go to, uh, human resources, to our uh, division, also to the state, uh, Commission of Human Rights, we're on the Commission for Human Rights, um, and the EEOC. So we make sure that they're aware of uh, the options that are available to them and encourage them to utilize those options. So our training is focused not just on those 
who are victims or potential victims of discrimination, but also those who would uh, dare perpetuate such an act. So we're, we make it very, very clear that we will not condone um, such behaviors. And my final question, do you also provide this training for state interns? Uh, we have not historically, though I will say that several interns have been directed to come to us uh, or encouraged to participate in our training, uh, but I have not made it part of the onboarding uh, per se. Now, that does not mean to say they don't get the training. I just have not been the facilitator of that training. So they may be at an agency that is having training, but there's no current requirement that any state intern um, participate in prevention of sexual harassment training. I'm not aware of, of a requirement. If I could add a little bit to um, Cheryl's presentation as well, or Cheryl's um, comments. Uh, Cheryl and I have been working very closely together. We are also in process of rolling out a web-based training. We had started that training back um, in late last year, and we determined that we really wanted to uh, make that uh, web-based training uh, better, continuous improvement, I would say. And so we're getting ready to roll out web-based training again, both as a um, refresher for employees. As Cheryl mentioned, her statistics are um, both for new employees and sometimes employees who have been um, with the state who get sent to Cheryl's training. In addition to that, we want to make sure that all the employees get uh, refresher training in sexual harassment. So our web-based training <coughs> is um, ready to go out probably in, uh, I would say, the next few weeks. And at the same time, we have also been finishing up our sexual harassment policy as well that will um, also go out along with that web-based training to employees of the state. And we'll track that um, in an LMS system that we'll be rolling out fairly soon. Thank you. Uh, actually, there was one more, I'm sorry. Is sure, that okay? no trouble, please. Um, the other question that I have for you is with regards to temporary employees and contractors. Uh, I know that we have quite a number of agencies within the state that do have contracted positions. Uh, and um, I would like to know whether or not those employees are also having sexual harassment training. We do not, uh, as a rule, we have not included them in the training. Occasionally I've had someone who is a contract employee attend the training, uh, but again, we have not uh, made it a requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very good questions. Thank you. Um, Representative Giavuso. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, ladies, thank you. Thank you for that nice presentation. Um, is the accused usually somebody of superior to the accuser in your experience? Well, it certainly could be. In the cases that we had, um, one was the superior. Another was um, someone providing service, so it was not um, a su superior to the individual. You think that would make them reluctant to come forward thinking that they might lose their jobs? As a superior, yes. I mean, that's quid pro quo harassment is often um, one of the most powerful types of harassment that uh, creates anxiety in anyone who is faced with that type of harassment. Um, it is very challenging. Could there be anonymous reporting in the beginning, at least, just so people come forward? Uh, we would encourage any reporting, any form of reporting, because frankly, we're held responsible and liable for any form of, of uh, harassment uh, in the workplace. So we would encourage uh, notification in any form, and we would act on that notification. Right, and I, and I do have another quick question. It was one of the last slides uh, where it showed there were eight cases in 2017. It seems like a fairly small number. It, do you think that might be because of what my last question was, that they just don't want to report it for the fear of retribution? Well, I would say it's difficult to, uh, to make any judgments about that. Uh, I, you know, these are not easy claims. These are not easy complaints. Uh, you know, the act of, of sexual harassment in the workplace uh, is very, very challenging. I think that um, we're doing a better job of ensuring that employees feel comfortable coming forward. It could be indicative of the fact that 
folks have not felt comfortable coming forward in the past. Uh, but I think uh, certainly with the attention that's been given to the issue of harassment in the workplace, this is sort of changing uh, the dynamics that take place in the workplace. And I think people are more encouraged and, and feeling more confident about coming forward. Uh, so I couldn't make any judgment about that number one way or the other, but I can tell you that we are improving our efforts to create an environment where people feel comfortable coming forward. That's what we want. Right. When I, when I saw that the first day, I, I thought two, one of two things, either that or maybe the word's not out that such an agency exists for them to even report. Could that be the case as well? We've done a lot of training for a lot of years, and as I mentioned, the State Equal Opportunity Office has been around since 1974. Um, I, throughout my years, I can recall attending trainings that were administered by the State Equal Opportunity Office. So I think there is certainly information out there, uh, but I think that we're improving on uh, the strategies that we've used in the past uh, for, the, for the simple reason that we need to make sure that people are aware of what to, what to do and where to go. Okay, and now, Madam Chairwoman, with your indulgence, I just have one more question. Of course. Um, the, what, what is the investigation process like? Is that really like, oh, my God, I, I don't want to go through it, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut? I mean, how, how, what, what, are, what is that like? So as I said, you know, these matters can be very challenging and very emotionally driven for anyone involved. Um, of course, we want to create an environment for the um, complainant to be able to speak freely and openly about what occurred. So this is a closed door meeting that takes place uh, with my staff and the individual. Um, we ask several questions. We want to know the nature of, of what happened and uh, you know we'll reach far into trying to find out uh, exactly what took place. Uh, we then set up a, a sort of a schedule of, of um, facts that we need to gather, areas that we need to explore, people we need to interview with, documents that we may need to, to gather. Uh, whatever the evidence or information that we need to ascertain, uh, we will undertake that, uh, that process. Uh, we then set up meetings and we'll do it in a way of, you know, the most important individual that we need to meet with down to witnesses that may have um, seen the events that unfolded. Um, we review the evidence, we review the, the comments, we, if we have to go back and talk to someone else after having met with uh, one other witness or uh, others that we've uh, questioned, we will, we will do that. Uh, but at the end of that investigation, uh, we tried to draw our conclusions based on uh, several factors, but uh, mainly on the facts that were presented to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Ms. Becker. Hi, thanks uh, very much. I have a couple questions about um, following up on what was just being asked. If I'm uh, looking at the slides correctly, two of eight were founded in terms of the complaints. And so I'm wondering, was there any differential depending on where a person went to report it? Well, the claims that we presented to you, um, the eight were from human resources. They were so all from human all resources, because you mentioned a number of different places that people could go. Yes. Those were all human resources. Yes. Okay, and what happened, if you know, to the people who went back to their jobs, the six? What kind of protections are available when they're not founded? Well, I can tell you that one of the uh, one of the emphasis that we make whenever we interview with someone that participates in an investigation is a reminder that retaliation is uh, a separate chargeable claim. And so we do caution all those that have uh, been a participant and those who have been questioned against any, uh, any potential, potential retaliation. And we also make sure that we speak with managers and the heads of the department or you know, we bring it to the highest level when that's necessary. And do you have a sense about that two of eight in terms of only a quarter of them being founded? Do you have any thoughts about that, why that might be? Well, I don't know the specifics of those claims, so it would be difficult for me. Um, again, they they went to human resources, and I'm not even sure Kyle would know. I mean, that's, because they were before your 
tenure, but how would you <laughs> respond to that? They were, they were before um, my tenure. Here, what I would say is that um, sometimes what happens is um, they, it might be that there are um, a, a miscommunication or things that are said and it's helping educate people to understand what they should do, what's right in the workplace. I think a lot of that is training and education and culture. Um, but I can't comment on exactly those claims. Arnold, did you have a question that you? Yes, please. The aspect of doing this can be somewhat. I'm sorry. Usually, as loud as I speak, I don't need a microphone. Um, this can be considered by be somewhat controversial by by some uh, individuals, maybe some organizations. But uh, I just want to know your opinion and whether or not you do this already, or maybe it's a possibility in the future of looking into this as having a. Uh, um, actually soliciting information from people uh, when you put out like a yearly policy review of the sexual harassment to put out some type of questionnaire that can be done web-based where you can actually solicit information from employees where they can volunteer at that point in time find out if they have been harassed say, in the past calendar year if the harassment is continuing and and further questions to go along with that which can be followed up by by an investigator I was just wondering your opinions on that Actually, I think it's a very good idea. Um, we don't currently have such a survey that I'm aware of. Um, but again, since the liability rests with the agency, with the, with the state, I think any effort that we make to solicit that information would be helpful, uh, whatever means possible. Uh, I, I like the idea. One of the other things that um, happens generally as you begin to do more training and education with people as well uh, is that you see more claims come to the forefront and that's also a possibility. But I do like that idea as well. It gives us a better understanding of what may be happening and what we might need to do to um, train further or change uh, the culture as well. Vice Chair McAtee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, now, there's nothing in the law that mandates that a victim has to come to either of your agencies first. Is that correct? Right. So uh, a person can go directly to court, uh, superior court, with a cause of action. Yes. So do we have, uh, are you familiar with what kind of numbers we might be looking at there? Uh, no, I don't have that information. So I think that's, that's another piece that we're missing. Uh, in all of these numbers, so uh, that would be good if we could somehow uh, get a hold of those numbers. Sure. Thank you. And I don't know if the Attorney General's office has any perspective um, in the number of cases that um, come through the court system or any, any idea on that. I know Mr. Rivora also has a presentation um, with a, a larger sample size, so to speak, um, and, and several years worth of data. Um, but since the question of the courts, I'm not sure if you have anything to add. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have a number for that. I'm sure it's something we could look into and compile a list of the number of cases that have come to our office. That would be wonderful at a future meeting. That would be great, very helpful. Thank you, Vice Chair McEntee. Did you have a question? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Verbal comments, are they related to emails or instant messages, you know, electronic communications, or are they more physical touching type? I know what we see in the corporate world, but I'm curious as to what the most common types of complaints that you see are. Well, of the two claims that came to our office within the last couple of years, one was a physical touching, uh, the other was uh, verbal comments that were made. And I would say um, at least what I saw in the stats that we have is more verbal. Um, there also, as Cheryl mentioned, there also was a touching as well, um, but mostly verbal. Wonderful. And um, I just have a, a couple of um, questions. The onboard training that you referred to was for new employees. It's three hours, if I recall, and it covers um, all types of discrimination. Yes, it does. Um, and then you um, 
also have, uh, do you have anything for the managerial level um, or any kind of uh, refresher pieces that might be, um, you know, smaller, uh, you know, shorter in, in period or, and more specific to areas? Like, for example, say the numbers were showing that in any particular department, there seemed to be a high number of reports, um, you know, kind of a refresher course that you could kind of parcel out and bring uh, to that agency or to that department? Yeah, so I have presented to agencies. I've done a cultural competency managing change um, module, which was about an hour's, uh, hour long. Uh, we're actually rolling out a management series uh, training right now, and I have actually a, a piece of that training. I'll be rolling out a, a portion of the training that I do. And you're right, I, I cover the topic of discrimination, which uh, covers a whole myriad of, of uh, types of uh, claims, uh, sexual harassment, and then the three-hour piece ends with a conversation on the topic of diversity, diversity and inclusion. Okay. Um, and then the EEOC on the federal level had put out a list of recommendations in March of 2017. Um, and are you um, using those as you reformulate and update your training process? Yes, we are reviewing that information as well. Okay, because I know that there were some wonderful, and it sounds like you've adopted some of them, um, but any uh, bystander intervention was one of the pieces that was included as a recommendation, um, one of many recommendations that they made. Um, I'm wondering if that is something that you have incorporated into your training. Absolutely, and I'm actually going to let Kyle speak to what we've done. Yes, and that's included in the bystander, um, excuse me, in the um, web-based training. We have a bystander intervention section on that as well. Okay, and um, while the web-based, um, you know, can be effective, how, what percentage of your trainings are done in person? So I've actually been the one that's been facilitating those trainings. Uh, we have increased our trainings from once um, every other month to in upwards of two or three times a month. So we're really increasing in terms of the number of trainings we're hosting. And I'm also seeing an increase in the number of participants in the training. We're also doing some on-site training. So we're going down to Zamorano and other um, outlying agencies of government. Uh, and I have a uh, team of staff that are actually going down and facilitating training uh, with uh, uh, the groups of employees. So we're trying to do as much as we can, given the leanness of our staff. Right. No, understandable. Um, and then the last question that I have, um, within your procedures, uh, do you allow for individuals to bring forward um, a report without pursuing it? You know, similar to what Rup G. Russo was referring to, there may be people who feel, I am not willing to go through the process. I'm not wanting to, um, you know, kind of upset the apple cart, but out of fear of having um, this person continue unabated with their, uh, you know, the accused um, to continue unabated with their practices, you know, having someone bring it to their, um, someone's attention without, that way if it were someone who had 10 reports brought, um, something could be done, but um, you know, one person being able to just merely make a report. I know that there, um, you know, when it comes to the police, sometimes you call 911, you report something, but you don't have to file a complaint. So that's kind of the, um, do you have any type of process where someone could call and simply make a statement, but not necessarily pursue a full, um, uh, you know, a full case, so to speak. So I do not have such a process in place. I will tell you that every allegation that's brought to our attention we address as a formal matter. Um, you're referring more to an informal process. Um, for our division, the level of liability that rests with the state for any of these allegations, we think it's imperative to pursue them. So even in the training, I really don't offer an option for uh, not addressing these matters. Um, we, th we think that we have a legal responsibility and a liability to protect the state uh, against such offenses. So um, I don't offer the option of not addressing it. I mean, I think we have a responsibility to address it, and that's how we respond to every allegation that is brought to our attention. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, and I think we will move, unless there are any additional? Yes, 
Thank Representative Bell Wilkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few more questions with regards to the web-based training, if you would, Ms. Morell. So the web-based training is going to be used for new hires or for refresher training. Uh, for the new hires, would this be offered to them during an orientation, or would they be required to use a computer within their workspace? So we've had some discussions on this. The uh, the online training is uh, the web-based training is not going to replace the required training that I offer for uh, specifically for two of the, uh, the new hires and, and any of the existing staff that would like to come uh, for a refresher. Um, and several individuals are actually directed to come to the training. So it is not intended to replace the training that I offer. Uh, but it is going to be afforded to all new hires. All new hires are required to go through the training that Cheryl does that is live training. And so the web-based training would only be refresher training, is that correct? That's correct. And where would the employee go to access this web-based training? Would they have to go to HR? Would there be a standalone computer in their own work site that they could go to? Uh, we're working out all the details. For those people that have computers actually at their desktop, they can go uh, right onto the training from their desktop. For employees, and there are a large number of employees who don't have computer access, the agencies can also do that um, in a group setting. So um, a conference room where they have um, multiple people there who will also um, sign in um, for that training and the agency would be responsible for making sure that human resources got the list of employees who actually attended. And then the plan is also to look at how we can have kiosks um, in different in the agencies so that people can actually go on during uh, their work time to take that training. Would there be any other web-based training? And the reason that I ask that is because if you're trying to encourage people to take this as refresher training, they may, they may feel that there's a stigma to them going to a kiosk that's specifically designed for sexual harassment training. The kiosk would be for multiple trainings. Okay, so it great. Would not be Thank you. That. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Representative Shanley. Hi. So if I'm a state employee and I want to know what the reporting procedures are for a sexual harassment claim, where do I go to find those and how would I know how to get there if I hadn't had been fortunate enough to attend your training? Well, hopefully you will have gone through the training. That's, that's our first hope. So if you're a new employee, you will know exactly where to go because we're making it mandatory and the procedures that we've set up we're actually capturing all new hires. So that's a huge improvement, thanks to Kyle and her team. Any other employee, there are several ways that they could find out. One is through their manager, um, and we're hoping that people will um, ask questions about where to go if they find themselves in such a situation. Uh, there is also uh, what's referred to as the affirmative action plan, which includes uh, directions and guidance on how to respond to any claim of discrimination. Uh, and the process is included in that plan as well. Do you think it would be helpful to have a workplace posting similar to what um, the uh, Department of Labor and Training has with your, your rights under state law that might indicate what the reporting procedures are for somebody just in a worst case scenario who's being harassed by somebody that is their direct supervisor and manager that may not know where to go from there or what the appropriate procedure is? Do you think it would be helpful to establish some reporting guidelines that were publicly posted and available for all state employees? Yes, I think as far as um, with, that we might actually do that in relation to rolling out our new policy, uh, that would be one thing that we could incorporate uh, in our that process. Our policy actually has the procedure in it for reporting, and that policy will be going out soon, and it will be included in the training as well. But I like the idea of the actual public posting. So you're, what you're suggesting is that in a number of places throughout state government that we have an actual document that lays out exactly what the process is. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Burrell? All right, we will. Thank you very much for your presentation and for responding to the questions from the um, task force.